Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's reading of the Torah portion, Parashat Pinhas. In Israel, they're reading Matoth. We will divide this teaching into two parts. About half will be dedicated to reading the first few verses in this week's parasha, which can be found in the book of Numbers, chapter 25. And then the other part, we will be reading uh, a few of the laws in the laws of Kriyat Shema, the laws of the recitation of Shema found in the Rambam's Mishneh Torah, the codification of Jewish law um, written by Maimonides. And we will be picking up from where we left off last week. So, getting right into it. I'll read the verse, and you read along with me. Vai da ber. Vai da ber. Adonai. This is the most holy name of God in the Hebrew language. Uh, often called or transliterated as Jehovah, though we know this is not the correct pronunciation. And it's also sometimes called the Tetragrammaton, if you want to do any research about it. But we, when we read this word in uh, formal recitation, we pronounce it as Adonai. And the reason for that is an entirely different topic. But suffice it to say, it is well known that that is not the proper pronunciation of this name. No one disputes that that is not the correct pronunciation of this name. But Adonai means Lord, and that is part of the meaning of the name. El Mersha Lemur Vaidaber Adonai El Mersha Lemur. This word is one of the most common words in the Torah, in the Hebrew Bible. It's from the root word, diber, which means he spoke. If you add a yud, a Y sound, to the beginning of a Hebrew verb, then it makes the tense of that verb future. So if diber means he spoke, Yedaber, Yedaber would mean he will speak. One of the distinguishing factors that distinguishes biblical Hebrew from modern spoken Hebrew is a concept called the reversing vav. So in biblical Hebrew, if you attach a vav to certain verbs in certain positions of a word, uh, especially at the beginning of a verse or the beginning of a sentence, then by adding the vav to that verb, the vav literally reverses the tense, the time at which the verb is intended to take place. So it, this, if yedaber means he will speak, then the vav here will cancel this yud. It will make it the opposite of he will speak, which would be he spoke. So it's effectively like saying diber. The reason for this, there are reasons, hypothesized reasons for this among linguists, but this is what's going on without getting into exactly why or how this function of the Vav developed. So just know that this is one of the most common words in the Torah. Vai Daber. Furthermore, these two dots underneath the letter Yud, these two dots at the bottom, are called Shiva. This is one of the more common Sim, sort of like a verb uh, symbol that you find in Hebrew words. It's important to know and remember that there are two types of Shabba that look exactly the same. And the only way you can tell the difference between those two Shabbas is if you learn a number of different grammatical rules, which you can learn in some other videos. But suffice it to say, um, in order to keep things simple until you learn the difference between the two types of Shiva and how they are different and pronounced differently. Suffice it to say that when you see a Shiva, if you do not know which way it should be pronounced, then 
don't pronounce the Shava. Consider it simply a marker to mark the end of a syllable, which means that if you're not sure, assume that the Shava, the two little dots, do not represent the vowel sound, but simply mean that the letter above it is related to and, and dependent on the vowel under the previous letter. So don't read this vaye daber. That's a very common mistake that non-Hebrew speakers make when they're learning Hebrew. They pronounce these shavas like every shava is a sounded shava, when that is not the case. More than likely, sometimes shava is a sounded shava, but more common and more accepted if you make a mistake doing it is that you will pronounce the shava as a silent sound. So instead of vaye daber, vaye daber. Let's read it again. Vai da ber Adonai el Moshe lemur. With Moshe, keep in mind, where is the O of the Mem in Moshe? So if you see this little dot above this letter, that little dot there is called Holam. Holam is the name for the O vowel in Hebrew. So where is the Holam in this Mem? So when a Holam should be pronounced, but it would come right before a sheen, which a sheen will always have a dot on the right side. What happens is that the, I guess the printing press, before we had the computer era, the computer age, um, the printing press was probably trying to save ink by uh, incorporating that holam, the o sound into the dot of the sheen. So if you have a sheen right before an o holam vowel sound, Many in many books, the dot of the sheen is serving a dual function, two purposes, both as the dot for the sheen as well as the dot for the o. So that's Moshe Lemur. This is the most common verse in the Bible. So, being the most common verse in the Bible, we will repeat it one more time. It literally is, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, right? So, Vai Daber. And he spoke, who spoke? Adonai. So Adonai is telling you who did the speaking. Why the ber Adonai? And the Lord spoke, El, to or toward. Moshe, Moses, Lemur, to say, or saying. The Aleph here has no vowel. And because there's no vowel associated with this aleph, we know not to pronounce this aleph as a glottal stop. The proper consonant pronunciation of aleph is a glottal stop. You can look that up in a uh, internet search if you want to know exactly what that is. But that's also a common error that people make when learning to read Hebrew. Only pronounce aleph as a glottal stop if there is a vowel above or below the letter aleph. If there is not, then read the word as if there is no aleph. So the mistake would be, many people would read this as le emur, but there's no vowel, so it's not le emur. You just read it like there's no aleph, le emur. Let's continue. Hin hos. Notice there's a line going up and down under this letter pe. That line that goes up and down is called a metig. It tells you to extend the sound of the vowel of this letter. In other words, to accentuate or accent the syllable of the word, this part of the word. Hin hos, then el azor, then aharon. So again, we have a metic, it's up and, up and down symbol, telling us to extra emphasize, extra accent this syllable. So instead of aharon, aharon hakohen, eshiv, eth, Hamofi or Hamoti, Me'al, Bene, Yisrael, De, Khan, E, again, the Shiva, two dots, one on top of each other. Just like here, if you don't know for sure how to pronounce it, whether it's a sounded Shiva or silent Shiva, then assume it is silent. And in fact, that is what it should be, how it should be read in this word. Same way as vai daber. So here you should say the kan o and not the kan o. So 
تقن او ات هم اتي بتخان ولا خليتي ات بني got a metag under there so instead of just bene it's bene is rael in ati metag lachen anur hinani got a metag so not just hinani but hinani not ten lo et bariti shalom so instead of just Shalom, it's shalom, really uh, elongated a little bit. All right. Now let's go on to reading the laws regarding the recitation of Shema. So in last week's lesson, we learned that the recitation of Shema, which we do twice a day, in the morning and, in, and at night before we go and before we go to bed, it doesn't have to be right before you go to bed, but in the morning at night, we recite these three passages from the Torah. And this is how we fulfill the Torah commandment to meditate upon, to recite the words of Torah when we lay down and when we arise. Now, that is a commandment given directly uh, by God. It's in the Bible, but the Torah does not tell us exactly what words to recite. That's not an explicit command in the Torah. It technically could be any of the words of the Torah, it's the general concept. But the sages of ancient Israel, who God commanded us to heed, as you can find in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse eight through 11, among many other places, the sages, Hazal, instituted that these will be passages that we read in the morning and in the evening in order to unify the people of Israel. And they had reasons for why they selected these three passages. And especially this first one, it's well known why, because it's a testimony uh, to Israel's uh, belief in the one God and our accepting the one God as our Lord, as our God, God of our lives and God of our nations, God of our nation. All right. So, in addition to that, we learned that there are certain blessings that the Torah does not command us uh, that we have to say these blessings, but the sages instituted those blessings that we say as praise to God before and after we recite these three Torah passages. Now, we are going to pick up in... Uh, so the last law that we learned last week regarded how the sages instituted those blessings before and after the recitation of Shema. And we were taught in Halakha number seven that there's a certain format that we're supposed to follow and we're not allowed to deviate from that format. Um, and basically that has to do with the first part and the last part of each of those blessings. And in the middle, the middle part of each blessing, there is room for variation among the Jewish people, and there traditionally has been some variation in the wording used. But all Jewish communities, all traditional Jewish communities, whether they are, were in Europe, in South Saudi Arabia, or in India, they all follow this format if they were those Jewish communities that did not lose contact with the great Sanhedrin. As it says here, uh, these blessings and all the rest of the blessings familiar to the Jewish people were instituted by Ezra the scribe and his court. One may not detract from them nor add to them. And again, this is in reference to the basic format. Uh, the sages did allow places where we can improvise. And the Talmuds, Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi, they give these basic formats, but they do not give all of the wording in between the beginning and endings of those uh, blessings. So there, again, is room for improvisation within certain limits, and Hazal, our sages, gave us those limits. So let's pick up in number eight. 
One who recites the second blessing before the first, whether in the day or at the night, or whether the transposed blessings are recited before or after Piet, fulfills his obligation since there is no absolute order to the blessings. A person who begins with the one who forms the light and concludes with the one who brings the evenings in the morning prayer does not fulfill his obligation. Were he to begin with the one who brings the evenings and conclude with the one who forms light, he would fulfill his obligation. Again, we're talking about in the morning prayer, and that kind of makes sense because we're in the morning. Were he to begin with the one who brings the evenings and conclude with the one who forms light in the evening, he would not fulfill his obligation in the evening. If he concludes with the one who forms light and concludes, I'm sorry, if he begins with the one who forms light and concludes with the one who brings the evenings, he fulfills his obligation since all blessings are defined by their conclusions. Again, this is if it's in the evening. Uh, this is, while this is definitely still the halakha, of course, but this particular halakha is more relevant. Uh, not that it's not relevant today, but it was a more relevant issue in times past before the printing press was invented because people very often prayed uh, by memory since there were not prayer books readily available everywhere. So such mistakes were much more common in the past. But today, you really don't have to worry about these things so much if you have a sidur on hand. Uh, a Jewish prayer book on hand. When is the proper time for the recitation of Shema at night? The commandment starts from the time of the appearance of the stars. Right? And we know from elsewhere that this is in reference to three medium-sized stars. A person who transgresses and delays fulfills his obligation if he recites the Shema before dawn. The sages establish the limit of midnight only in order to distance us from negligent wrongdoing. One who reads the Shema of the night after dawn but before sunrise, does not fulfill his obligation unless he was unavoidably detained, for example, drunk or sick, or in a similar situation. And it goes without saying that one should not put himself in one of these situations on purpose, i.e. Purim. A person who was so detained and reads the Shema at this time does not recite the blessing, lay us down. That's Hashkivena. When is the proper time for the recitation of the Shema during the day? The commandment is that one should start to read before sunrise in order to conclude and recite the last blessing with the sunrise. This measure of time is one tenth of an hour before the sun rises. A person who delays and reads the Shema after the sun rises fulfills this obligation for the proper time is until the end of the third hour of the day for one who transgresses and delays. And that is for one who uh, transgresses and delays the ideal time established by the sages, which would be before sunrise. Um, uh, Rav David Bar Hayim, you can find his YouTube channel. Uh, he has a video on this in which he expresses his opinion that this length of time would be even longer nowadays since the uh, practice of getting up nowadays is much longer than it was in times past. Of course, that's debatable, but that's that's a extremely well learned rabbi's opinion on the matter and okay halakha 12 one who is over hasty and recites the shema of the morning prayers after dawn even though he finishes before sunrise fulfills his obligation in extraordinary circumstances one who rises early in order to travel one may recite it at the outset from dawn one who recited the shema after the end of the third hour, even if he was unavoidably detained, does not fulfill his obligation to recite the Shema at its proper time. He can be compared to one who studies Torah. He should recite the blessings preceding it and after it all day long, even if he delays and recited it after the end of the third hour. So even if the proper time for reciting Shema with its blessings passes, according to the Rambam, you can still say the Shema and recite the blessings before and after it. You have the whole day to do that until the time for evening Shema arises. Uh, so basically until the end of the day, until around sunset or, or the appearance of three stars. And this is Rambam's opinion. It's not the most widely held opinion today, but you can go by this if that's what you want to do. But again, you would be fulfilling rabbinic uh, obligations there, but not the Torah obligation of reciting Shema when you lie down and when you arise.
but there, as it says here, there is a command to learn Torah the entire day. So uh, you fulfill the commandment of learning Torah anytime you learn Torah through the whole day. And that concludes chapter one of the laws of Shema found in Mishneh Torah, the Rambam's codification of uh, Talmudic law. That's Maimonides. And you can read more if you like. Uh, we used here Chabad.org, but you can find it elsewhere as well. And I wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom, a pleasant and peaceful Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom Aleichem wa al Israel. A Sabbath of peace unto you and to all Israel. Shalom Abraham.